Okay. Uh, got a couple minutes of preliminaries, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome, uh, everyone. Uh, for those of you who may not know, I'm Walter Sterling, the Dean of St. John's College in Santa Fe. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all to the Dean's Lecture and Concert Series. Uh, we're happy to continue to have occasional opportunities to offer talks remotely, and we, we offer a special, extend a special welcome to our graduates with students in our two master's programs in the low residency offering, uh, most of whom are not able to attend our uh, regular events on campus. So we're happy to have uh, you all join us uh, this, this evening. Uh, the format will be uh, that Ms. Elliott will offer a, a talk here of about an hour. And I'm just gonna let people know that she does have uh, slides, uh, images, uh, slides that she'll be sharing. So if uh, that affects how you're gonna be set up and so on, you, you, you can take that into consideration. Uh, at the end of the talk, we will close this webinar and we'll open a Zoom meeting so that we can have an interactive um, uh, question period and conversation. Those have gone quite well. It's nice to be able to see each other and interact that way. The link was shared at the same time and in the same format that you would have received this link, but I'll also put it um, in the chat thread visible to everybody for a minute before closing the webinar. And um, we have a tradition at the college of not introducing our own. Were we in the Great Hall? Uh, Ms. Elliott would walk up uh, to the dais and begin. And I don't really like to break that with a proper full introduction, but I do want to thank and welcome my, my friend and colleague, Natalie Elliott. Very grateful that you're willing to uh, uh, share your thinking with us tonight and in this uh, format. Um, and uh, I do want to say that I'm especially happy to uh, have you sharing reflections on these themes with us, and again, not a proper bio, but in ways that perhaps will come up in the talk or in the question period. Uh, Miss Elliott is uh, both a tutor and an explorer in some other forums that have her both uh, reading a great deal and writing uh, in the fiction genre, and also doing a lot of study and writing on uh, science, natural science, technology, um, and thinking a lot about literature on those on those themes. So I feel like all of that's bound up in your in your talk tonight. And I actually don't have it open in front of me, so I might let you share your title again, lest I scramble it. I think I know what it is. But without further ado, I'll go ahead and hand it over to you. Uh, welcome, uh, Natalie Elliott. Thank you very much, Walter, and thank you for everyone. To everyone who's here, um, I am just going to get my slides going. And um, I'll just say as a, a practical matter, if you need, if you can't see all the parts of the slides, you may not need to. I will probably read off of almost all of them, but I wanted to give people a chance to be able to. Um, read along because some of the stuff I'm going to talk about is pretty subtle and and difficult and so getting your own head into the language can be helpful um, but you can reduce the the pictures of the 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 images on the side of the screen if they're in the way of the slides um, but yes uh, thanks again Walter um, this talk is called is a short story like a mathematical proof and I'm really grateful for the chance to um, try to think on this a little bit more rigorously than I had been, even though it had been um, rolling around in my brain for several years. Um, and um, it seems probably like kind of a weird question, unless maybe you are already at St. John's and you know that comparing these two kinds of things um, might not be completely weird, but I think conventionally it's probably a weird thing to do. Um, these two kinds of things seem very different. Uh, mathematical proofs seem like these logically rigorous, deeply rational, um, coherent, strategically built kinds of objects that we 
go into in order to arrive at certain conclusions, short stories seem like the kind of thing that involves subjectivity and the messiness of our contingent lives and particularity and detail. And they are often um, preferred as a matter of taste and they are uh, subject to human emotions. They are about human emotions and the messiness of those things. So they seem very different from proofs. Um, short stories seem like a matter of art. Mathematical proofs seem like a matter of science. That's at least the conventional reputation for these things. And so it probably seems kind of weird to ask the question even in the, on the face of it. But um, I think that anyone who spent time in either one of these um, kinds of forms knows that they're much subtler and much more dynamic than that conventional reputation um, suggests. So we know that if we enter into mathematical proofs, it actually involves a great deal of creative thinking and often a lot of emotional work. Um, and it can sort of open up into dynamic places that we don't expect. Um, there is a great deal of particularity and maybe even poetry in the language of mathematical proofs. And on the other hand, um, short stories, I think, seem to have this kind of logical coherence that takes us to different kinds of emotional planes. They work in dimensionality, they're deeply structured. And I think sometimes when we read a short story that really moves us, it lands just like a proof. I think at the end of a, some kinds of stories, maybe a Flannery O'Connor story, for example, the ending can just jar us and move us in the same way that a compelling proof can move us. And so um, I think there are base, uh, there is a basis for comparison and um, it's actually maybe kind of interesting to think about why these two things actually seem more similar than they, than they appear in the way that we think about them in the world that we live in. Um, so I, I'm not just sort of coming at this from out of nowhere. I, I ha there is sort of a backstory to why I got interested in making this comparison and, and thought others might be interested in hearing about it. Um, as Walter mentioned, I've been a tutor at St. John's since 2011. So I spent 2011 to 2018, um, I had spent a lot of time in the math curriculum with under undergraduates in particular. Uh, working through our freshman, sophomore, and junior math classes. And so we spend a lot of time in mathematical proofs and also in all of the conceptual worlds that those proofs bring us to. So in demonstrations, in new kinds of language, in notation, in paradoxes, in thinking about mathematical definitions and what mathematical objects are. And so um, that was something that I kind of had in my head. And when I went in 2018 to a kind of strange and old school literature MFA program for creative writing in Montana, where I spent the last two years reading massive amounts of short stories. Um, and one of the things that happened when I got there was that I continually started to think, oh, this short story is just like that proof from exhaustion. Uh, this short story is like that, that thing in Dedekind where he's questioning the number line. This short story is like Zeno's paradox. And it just happened over and over and over again. Um, my classmates, I think some of them uh, got a little tired of this and thought I had sort of lost my mind or was a, at least a little strange. I mean, why couldn't I just read stories on their own terms? Why did I need this weird comparison to make sense of anything? And I think part of what was going on is that I was trying to figure out these very strange kinds of artifacts that were moving me so deeply. Um, and that also seemed to really have um, a, an extraordinarily powerful structure underneath them that was mapping onto cognitive structures that I knew. And so I, I, some of my friends uh, tolerated this exploratory thinking and started to point me to writers who actually saw this as well. And so I got, got to know some writers who are very different from one another, including uh, David Foster Wallace and Alice Munro. And these are writers who both started to see, uh, to show me how much mathematical thinking actually enters deeply into our lived experience. And they rendered this in short fiction that represents the human experience in different ways. And so 
Um, I'll talk about those two writers, but but the, the, the talk is actually really motivated by this bigger thing, which is that I think in the narrative structures of short stories, there is something akin to proofs. And um, so um, I think some writers get that and they pick up on it and they play with it a lot in their stories. And I will point to those eventually, but I, I want to actually just start with um, look, looking at some short stories that uh, illustrate that there's, there's a kinship, even if those authors weren't, aren't aware of that. It's not that they thought that they were doing this. It's just that there's a sort of shared um, kind of intuitive world that I'm hoping you'll start to see a little bit more as I go through the examples I'm going to talk about. So here's what I'm going to do. Um, the, the, the first part of this talk, I, I'll, I'll spend a little time just drawing attention to some of the aspects of mathematical proofs and conceptual moves that kept coming up for me when I was looking at all of these stories and thinking, hey, that's, that's like, that thing from our junior math class. Um, and uh, I will say that obviously I, I, I can't go through entire proofs, especially the proofs that I am going to refer to. So there will be just parts of these. Um, I also know I'm dealing with an audience that is very diverse in terms of how much people have read any of the work that I'm talking about. So some people here have read all of it, some have read none of it, and there's everything in between. And so um, I, what I'm doing is go I'm going to give you sort of parts of the math that I think will illustrate some part of the proof that I think is significant from that work and also helps look, helps shed light on some part of a short story, which I'm also going to show you. So ideally, you, will, you would be inspired to go and read these proofs and talk about them with other people and read some of these short stories and see for yourself on the whole how they cash out on this question, but um, I hope that I'll be able to show you by looking at parts of things that there might be a whole story here worth taking more seriously. Um, so uh, the other thing I'll say is that uh, I do ask the question is a short story like a mathematical proof, but these are going to be parts of proofs too. They're not, there, there is conceptual work that precedes proofs proper and what a proof is is itself a question that's pretty fascinating and a lecture unto itself. So you're going to get bits of things that uh, set proofs up. And um, that I think are sort of preconditions often for proofs. My first point that I want to make is that proofs often rely or are motivated by um, recognition of a paradox that has captured the mind of a mathematician. So um, anyway, so the point is prepare for a whole bunch of pieces that uh, of mathematical ideas that <laughs> set up proofs and are part of that story, but that themselves might not be the proof proper. Um, but I'll give you some nuggets too. So the lecture, as they say with these things, has three parts. <laughs> the first, I'll just give you a sense of the kinds of conce conceptions that were rattling in, around in my brain when I was comparing proofs and short stories way out in Montana. And the second part, I'll show you some parts of short stories that I think um, echo or at least um, share some of the intuitive and conceptual work that I that I had in mind when I was reading them, and then I'll I'll conclude by just offering some reflections on what you know what we what we see when we when we treat these kinds of imaginative objects together. What opens up when we when we look at them side by side on their own terms. Okay, so as I said, the first thing I, I want to talk about is that um, mathematical um, proofs often start or in, are motivated by a paradox. They want to try to figure out um, what is going on when we confront a conceptual paradox. And so at St. John's, for example, and, and probably for many of you who may not have come across all of the paradoxes that we face in the math curriculum in our undergraduate side, of the program, um, one of the sets of paradoxes that's very familiar is those of Zeno. So you may recall probably the most fam famous of Zeno's paradoxes, the Achilles and the tortoise. So Achilles is in a race with the tortoise. The tortoise is uh, slower. So the Achilles is a nice guy. He gives him a little head start. And the tortoise 
is off. And Achilles, everyone expects because he's faster, will catch up to the tortoise. But the tortoise uh, always is able in the time that Achilles is trying to catch up to him to go just a little bit farther ahead, that little piece that he originally started with. And so Achilles is never able to catch up with him. Now, that is something that we know isn't quite right, but the idea, the way that we hear the paradox maybe, which is itself kind of a story, um, makes us wonder well, what what would be going on that that would actually seem somewhat plausible and yet seem so at odds with how we experience distance. Um, another paradox that we talk a lot about at St. John's is a paradox that Aristotle gives us. Now my slides, here we go. Ah, figured out what button I have to push. Um, is a paradox that we hear about from Aristotle. It's called known as Aristotle's wheel and Galileo riffs on this himself and maybe thinks about it in a slightly different way. So it has a legacy. It comes up over and over again. And this paradox, um, ju I just wanted to bring it up because I think it gives us just one really quick and easy example of a, a cool mathematical paradox that makes us think. Um, in this paradox, uh, we have two circles, one circumscribes the other, and therefore they obviously have different sizes of circumferences. And yet if we wheel them out um, dynamically in our mathematical imaginations, we can see that um, when they wheel the entire length of the outer circle, the inner one seems to go the same length, and that seems to measure the circumference of the circle, which we see in this diagram is the same length. So I'll just do, we have this handy dandy video. You, now it's gonna reverse time and go backwards, but you can see that um, this seems like a very puzzling thing. It looks like we're dealing with two things at the same time. Um, so what is, uh, the, the point here is that not that I'm going to give you a way to resolve this right now, but this is the kind of thing that I think often inspires mathematical proofs. We start with something that looks very simple, and yet it we look at it in a way that delivers a contradiction. It looks like we have two different size circumferences here, and actually, when we roll them out, it looks like the lengths of those circumferences are equal. That's very strange. What is the root of that? And that prompts us to think about the circles, the lines in which they're built. Perhaps we think, well, is this different in a theoretical world or a mechanical world, and so on. So. This is just the kind of thing I'm talking about when I'm saying paradoxes can often get us into a question about the figures, the mathematical figures that we're, that we're interested in. Now, how do I turn my, ah, okay. So um, another thing that mathematical proofs do that I kept thinking about when I was reading stories and making this comparison is they often um, question the foundation of our conceptual system. And so what one of the places where this came up for me or came, what one of the things that came to mind was Dedekind's essay, Continuity and um, Irrational Numbers. And in that essay, um, Dedekind proves that um, the, 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 there is continuity in the real numbers. And so there is a proof, but he sets it up and opens the essay by saying, hey, we do not have an arithmetic foundation for calculus. We are relying on assumptions about the geometric figures that we use in calculus. And we need to find a way to justify those arithmetically. We haven't done that. And so we're basically, calculus is, is not on a strong foundation. Um, I'll just read the passage and I'll maybe say a little bit about a way to think about that that could be a little bit easier than just you know, thinking about calculus, which which might not be immediately obvious to, to some of the people listening and maybe is to others, but you know, there's a there there are sort of different ways into this claim. And I'll I'll give you a couple of ways to look at it. So this is a passage from the beginning of that essay where Dedekind is calling into question uh the 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 way that we we assume we know things in calculus that we don't. So he says, the, the statement is so frequently made that the differential calculus deals with continuous magnitude, and yet an explanation of this continuity is nowhere given. 
even the most rigorous expositions of differential calculus do not base their proofs on, upon continuity, but with more or less consciousness of the fact that they either appeal to geometric notions or those suggested by geometry or depend upon theorems which are never established in a purely arithmetic manner. Um, so one of the things that uh, we talk about a lot at St. John's is the relationship between um, counting and geometric magnitudes. And so the way that we, I think we could get into the question that, that Dedekind is after here is by thinking about a number line. Is a number line a good representation of counting? And we can think about it, you know, one, two, three, four, or five, six, the numbers roll out into a line and unfurl in a way, but what do we do with all of the numbers in between one, two, three, four, five? Well, some of those seem to fall into place pretty neatly. The, the, the rationals, okay, we can deal with those, just round up that decimal, I guess, or find a place for them. But what about the irrational numbers like pi or the square root of two? What, how do they how do they fit in? And what about all of the other infinite number of numbers that fall in between all of those numbers that we might line up on a number line? Do we have a way to account for those? Or do we have a line that is full of holes? And if our diagrams from calculus are relying heavily on geometric analogies to make their arguments, if they rely on the continuity of those lines and all of the points on the lines being contiguous and not full of holes, as though the points on those lines correspond to numbers, then um, do we have an account of all of the possible numbers that we could hit? And if we don't have an account of the irrationals, we need to get one. So D Dedekind kind of pokes holes, I guess you could say, if you'll forgive the pun, in, all, in our notion of uh, geometric continuity. And then he gives us a proof for how we can uh, find continuity in the, the real numbers. Um, so this is a place where I thought, you know, a proof starts by just poking holes in the world and the way we think the world works and what we rely upon to reason about it. Um, another thing that proofs do that came to mind often for me is that they give us new definitions and those new definitions help build theoretical intuitions. Um, they help us not only just pin down ideas that are essential to the arguments that we're going to read. In fact, I don't know if they ever really do pin that down. They also, but, but more importantly, they kind of give us a conceptual framework in which we start to think a certain way that is different from how we might think if we just thought about the concept that we're dealing with without the particular dynamic definition that we're getting. So as anyone who has spent time in the first day of freshman mathematics as St. John's knows, um, there's a huge number of things that we can say when we start to think about Euclid's definition of a point. A point is that which has no part. The other three sentences on the slide are the other, the first four definitions, there are more. Um, but uh, I'll just read them because I think once you just start to hear them, they have this way of resonating and they, to me, they almost sound like poetry. Um, a point is that which has no part. A line is a breadthless length. The extremities of a line are points. A straight line is a line which lies evenly with the points on itself. Um, now, there are a lot of things that we can say about all of these, and uh, I obviously cannot exhaust those things or even begin to do justice to the depth of the definitions. But um, I think that one of the things that I want to just emphasize here in, in the way I'm thinking about these for the purposes of this talk is that um, the, point, it, 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 the point is that which has no part takes us to away from just drawing a point. It takes us from the moment when we are just putting a dot on a page that we might think of as a kind of material thing. And it places us in a theoretical world in which uh, the materiality of things is not acting the same way. And so we suddenly have the foundation or, or just like a very essential part of a mathematical space. And I think it seems like these are simple things that are probably 
kind of obvious when you think about it a little bit. Of course, we need a definition of a point if we're going to do Euclid's geometry. But I, I think there is actually something quite remarkable about just placing the mind in, an, in a space where the mathematical object has qualities that are distinct from what the object that corresponds in the material world might have. And just starting to get the mind to separate itself into that mode is, is an amazing kind of conceptual feat. And so um, the Euclidean version of this maybe looks kind of basic and um, it's probably beautifully so I think. Um, and, but it's also deeply dynamic and it makes us start to think about these things in another way. Um, another place where I think definitions and sort of setting down new language starts these kinds of dynamic processes that help us develop the intuitions that we need in order to understand proofs is, um, it came up in, in Georg Cantor's um, essay, which also includes a proof, and he um, is someone we re read in junior mathematics. So I want to just look at his um, version of this and sort of give you another taste for what I'm thinking about and what he might be thinking about in the language that he uses when he's introducing a new kind of number to us. So these are quotations from an essay called The Founding of the Theory of Transfinite Numbers. And that essay is known for being a proof of the uncountability of the real numbers. It's also something, a proof that helps us see relatedly that uh, there are some infinities that are larger than others. So if you haven't read that text or aren't familiar with that argument, um, it probably seems a little bizarre to you that, you know, infinity plus one equals infinity. Well, how could we possibly have an infinity that is larger than that? Um, how could there be one? Well, if you'd like to sort of understand or get an ear for that, you have to kind of develop a new conceptual framework in, in which you are capable of receiving the reasoning that Cantor is going to give to us. Um, so he does this uh, by setting up conceptual uh, sort of pro processes that we go through in order to start to recognize and be and be capable of comparing the set of the reals with the set of the rationals. And um, he, uh, he starts just in the opening of the essay, he even starts to talk about intuition. So I want to just read from some of the things that he's talking about and say a little bit about the dynamic conceptual processes that he's asking us to engage in. Um, and then I think you'll get a, a little bit of a sense of that, that kind of intuition building that um, I think all proofs depend upon and, um, and are, um, the, you know, and are sort of creatively provoking us into. So um, this is just from the opening. The conception of power or cardinal number. By an aggregate, we are to understand any collection into a whole M of definite and separate objects M of our intuition or thought. These objects are called the elements of M. And so we're getting, uh, we're starting here. Actually, let me just see here. Oh yeah, I'm gonna just keep reading, there's more to this. <laughs> okay, every aggregate M has a definite power, which we will also call its cardinal number. We will call by the name power or cardinal number of M, the general concept, which by means of our active faculty of thought arises from the aggregate M when we make abstraction of the nature of its various elements M and of the order in which they are given. We denote the result of this double act of abstraction, the cardinal number or power of M by M with double lines, capital M with double lines. Since every single element M, if we abstract from its nature becomes a unit, the cardinal number M with double lines is a definite aggregate composed of units. And this number has existence in our mind as an in intellectual image or projection of the given aggregate M. So just on the most basic level, um, Cantor is interested in 
the cardinality of numbers and in that move we make when we, but, but also I think in sort of cardinality of any way that we group objects together. So this is a theoretical notion. It doesn't necessarily refer to numbers in the very opening. It seems to be interested in what is going on cognitively when we're taking a group of disparate objects and making a one thing out of them and at the same time being capable of reflecting on the number in the way that number unfurls in our minds of those objects before they became or as they become also the object of the one thing that we're talking about so i realize it's it's hard to even describe these things but what I what I want to just draw attention to this because he notices that this is an intuitive act. He thinks that we're getting into a kind of thinking, and he's preparing us for ways of thinking about groups of numbers. We're going to be comparing the set of the rationals and the set of the reals. That is the way we have to start thinking about them in order to be able to see the different size that we're dealing with. Um, another part of the text, this is later in the same essay, um, he gives us another activity that's essential to making this comparison. Um, he says, by a covering, and this is a kind of way of thinking about the parts in relation to the parts in two different sets of numbers, by a covering of aggregate of the aggregate n with the with elements of the aggregate m, or more simply by a covering of n with m, we understand a law by which with every element n of n, a definite element of m is bound up where one and the same element of m can come repeatedly into application. So we're engaged here in a process of comparing the parts of one group to the parts of another and seeing the configurations that those pairings can take. Now, I'll say I'm glad Ms. Shukla is in this weird room in which I am talking to myself on a Zoom call, <laughs> and I know you are out there because when I taught this the first time, I have memories of us getting up on the board and mapping out all of these kinds of pairings and sort of seeing how that they work together. Now, I'm taking this passage out of context. It's probably kind of hard to just see how it's working as a dynamic part of this entire essay and, and, and the proof that is in the heart of it. But I, um, I think what I'm trying to get at here is that Cantor is giving us conceptual frameworks that we have to engage with dynamically and we have to see how they work. The other thing you might notice here is that these ways of wording this are pretty weird. And if you feel that way, even after having read this, that's how I feel too. We can share in that weirdness together. Um, and I point this out because I think a, another experience of mathematics that came up a lot for me when I was making this comparison with short stories is that we often have to sort of beat our heads up against it for a while before it becomes clear what it's up to. We have to maybe not bash our heads open entirely, but at least try our brains out on it in different for formations. Because sometimes when we don't quite grasp what the uh, mathematician is showing us, we're asking us to do dynamically, and we don't fully internalize that conceptual move that we need to make, we can't experience the proof. And so we have to sort of try it out quite a few ways. And I think that that is something that really um, is kind of good for us psychologically, ultimately, but it's also ex extremely difficult. And I think that in a way, I'll, as I'll show later, um, art often asks us to do that as well. And, and it opens up in, in maybe an analogous way. So that's something that is happening here, I think, if we are wrestling with Cantor. <laughs> um, and again, I'll just leave on this last slide. Um, this is where he gives us a new kind of number. He gives us a name for it. Um, the smallest transfinite cardinal number, the number that represents that larger infinity, the first one, is called a list zero. Aggregates with finite cardinal numbers are called finite aggregates, countable. All others we will call transfinite aggregates and their cardinal numbers transfinite cardinal numbers. So by the time we get to the sixth part, if we've followed him, he suggests that 
um, we will be able to understand the, this new number and also how much larger it is than the um, other infinity that is made up of the naturals or the rationals. Um, so uh, the thing that's sort of funny here I, I, is that we, I think when I read this with tutors and with students, we don't often feel that way by the time we get here. We have to go around in circles. We've read this thing out of order. He introduces the concept in the fourth part, and then we often read the sixth before it even becomes clear, and we have to sort of loop back. And so anyway, again, I think there's this, this experience in mathematics that requires going back to the same thing and trying again in a different way or trying again in a way that helps you build to the next step. Um, the last point about the mathematics um, stuff that I'll make before I shift to the stories is um, that uh, one of the things that came to mind is that it's often the case in proofs that um, a puzzle, a problem, a difficulty is unsolvable on one dimension and then becomes kind of somehow solvable or rational on another. So the, the sort of core example of this that I think is familiar to most people interested in this stuff is uh, Pythagorea, Pythagoras' constant. So we experienced this geometrically um, in the freshman math curriculum at St. John's. Um, so the side of the triangle, the right triangle cannot be measured by I'm sorry, the diagonal of the triangle cannot be measured by its sides. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the, the arithmetic version of this is, is that the diagonal of the sides, I'm sorry, the length of the diagonal is root two of a right triangle with a side of one. And that's what I've got represented here. But um, we know also from Pythagorean theorem that the, the square on the side of that diagonal is commensurate with the sides, the squares on the sides of the of the right triangle. So we know that, in other words, the 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 the, the, the irrationality of the side the the irrationality of the diagonal of the triangle is commensurate in square. So it's it's a we're able to measure rationally the square on the diagonal in a way that we can't when we're just looking at the lines. And so um, I think, you know, this is another place where we see that in one dimension, we get a kind of irrational answer or something that's deeply puzzling. And in another respect, another dimension, it starts to become clear. Um, and I think here too, I imagine that there was probably some head beating by those old cultish Pythagoreans when they discovered that the sides could not measure the diagonal. The mathematical universe seemed completely insane for a little while until they figured out that the square could solve things. Um, but in any case, we've come across this in a few places. And uh, I think it's something that comes to mind for me sometimes when I'm talking about short stories. So now I'm going to switch gears and to the sort of literary world where this started to become clear to me that <laughs> there, there are a lot of things going on in stories that actually look like this. And the first thing I want to do is talk about um, Kafka's Metamorphosis, the opening. So for all of these stories, pieces that I'm going to talk about, I'll, I'll, I have a passage that I like to read because I think it's very important to get into contact with the language and hear exactly how the writer is doing this because the subtlety often really makes the comparison quite sharp. Um, all right, so it's now story time. You can sit back and relax. There are no more diagrams, only words, and I'll read them to you. So it's just like audible. Um, all right, so let's see. Now I have the small problem, which is that I cannot see my words because the video is, here we go, I have to just move this. All right. Um, Okay. 
As Gregor Samsa awoke one morning out of restless dreams, he found himself in bed, transformed into a gargantuan pest. He lay on his hard armored back and saw as he raised his head a little, his domed brown belly divided into arched segments. He could hardly keep, hardly keep the bed sheets from sliding from his stomach's height completely to the floor. His numerous legs, lamentably thin, in comparison to his new girth, flickered helplessly before his eyes. What has happened to me, he thought. It was no dream. His room, a proper room for a human being, albeit a little too small, lay still between the four familiar walls. Above the table, upon which a collection of sample cloth goods was spread out in stacks, Samsa was a traveling salesman, hung the picture which he had cut out of an illustrated magazine a little while ago and set in a pretty gilt frame. It depicted a woman who, with a fur hat and a fur boa, sat erect, lifting up in the direction of the viewer a solid fur muff into which her entire forearm had disappeared. Um, so this uh, opening, I think, is wonderful and made me think a lot about those paradoxes that we meet in mathematics because um, Kafka does not allow us to collapse the surreal into the real. He wants us to sit and listen to this world in which a man can become a bug. And the clue to that, I think, is that he doesn't want us to say this was a dream. He's lying in bed. Gregor is lying in bed, but it was no dream. And so from the get go, we have to sit in this story and live with a surreal world in which a man is a bug and a very mundane room that seems utter utterly realist for a human um, and sort of hang out there. He's going to ask us to do that. And so if we're going to enter into this story, we're going to have to just accept that both of those things are going on and have them hang together. And we can't really get out of the story alive unless we start to um, figure out or work with whatever he's putting forward in these two respects. Um, I'll also point out that one of the things that Kafka does that's very interesting is that in the latter part of the story of this, these two paragraphs, he gives us a sense, maybe a little hint uh, at where we might have to go here uh, in this, this woman who's in, in depicted in the image. And she is, um, her, her entire forearm almost disappears in the fur muff that she's holding. So it almost looks like she looks like an animal. And so in that depiction, the realist world, it seems that humans are being kind of swallowed up by animalistic coverings. And maybe that, so maybe that's part of what's being hinted at here, that the surreal world may not actually be as far from the real real or sort of truly rendered or accurately rendered world than we might expect. Um, so another place where I think we get something um, kind of like the paradoxes, but probably more like what Dedekind is up to um, when he's puncturing our number line, um, is in a uh, work called Emergency by Dennis Johnson, which I'll read from momentarily. And that story um, involves a situation where we have our emotions excited in a lot of different directions. I think one of the things that's very striking about short stories that are quite powerful is that they often begin by shattering our emotional expectations and exciting multiple conflicting emotions at once. Um, they also seem to excite emotions that we don't necessarily have words for, and they make us really confused about what kind of universe we're living in. So I'll read from this Dennis Johnson opening and say a bit more about what I think he might be up to and why I think this, this reminded me of the kind of mathematical move that involves shattering some kind of sacred or assumed position that we need to have in order to make a whole system of the world work. Okay. I'd been working in the emergency room for about three weeks, I guess. This was 1973 before the summer ended with nothing to do on the overnight shift, but batch the insurance reports from the daytime shifts. 
I just started wandering around over to the coronary care unit, down to the cafeteria, et cetera, looking for Georgie, the orderly, a pr pretty good friend of mine. He often stole pills from the cabinets. He was running over the tiled floor, the operating room with a mop. Are you still doing that? I said. Jesus, there's a lot of blood here, he complained. Where? The floor looked clean enough to me. What the hell were they doing in here? He asked me. They were performing surgery, Georgie, I told him. There's so much goop inside us, man, he said, and it all wants to get out. He leaned his mop against the cabinet. What are you crying for? I didn't understand. He stood still, raised both arms slowly behind his head and tightened his ponytail. Then he grabbed the mop and started making broad random arcs with it, trembling and weeping and moving all around the place really fast. What am I crying for? He said, Jesus, wow, oh boy, perfect. Um, so this is the opening of this story. And I imagine already you are feeling a little uncertain about where to land. Georgie seems in some respects kind of funny. He's also um, sort of morbid and in a situation where they're dealing with life and death situations and a lot of blood. And yet he seems to think that uh, he's got to keep mopping and the blood is uh, there, but it doesn't seem to be. Then he's crying. The narrator doesn't know why he's crying. Then he seems to be indignant at the narrator for the cry for not understanding. And so it has this kind of comical flavor, I think, but also seems kind of grave, maybe problematic. Is Georgie high? Well, it turns out he is. We learn this, and Georgie sort of squishes around in his shoes for the next two scenes and sort of makes uh he seems to be kind of a character who's both sort of problematic and troubling for us, but also kind of comical. Um, and then in the fourth section, here's what happens. Around 3.30 a.m., a guy with the knife in his eye came in, led by Georgie. I hope he didn't do that to him, nurse said. Me? Georgie said. No, he was like this. My wife did it, the man said. The blade was buried to the hilt in the outside corner of his left eye. It was a hunting knife kind of thing. Who brought you in, nurse said. Nobody, I just walked down. It's only three blocks, the man said. Nurse peered at him. We'd better get you lying down. Okay, I'm certainly ready for something like that, the man said. She peered a bit longer into his face. Is your other eye, she said, a glass eye? It's plastic or something artificial like that, he said. And you can see out of this eye, she asked, meaning the wounded one. I can see, but I can't make a fist out of my left hand because this knife is doing something to my brain. Okay, so I read the second passage because I think it kind of gives you a sense of, of how bizarre and um, uncanny this whole story seems to be. And I think what Johnson is doing uh, is really unsettling our emotional range. Um, on the one hand, we get the sense that there is deep urgency here, but at the same time, this is rendered with a lot of comic devices. It's funny, and I think I think the kind of comedy we experience to the extent that we do is a sort of gasping, horrified comedy. I don't know, or, or horrified laughter that sort of gulps down. I don't know what you call that. It seems like the kind of thing I don't even have a name for. Um, maybe someone does. But in any event, this is the kind of thing that I think opens short stories that really kind of shatter us, our, our, our emotional expectations, and make us kind of wonder, well, what, how are we supposed to think about this? How are we supposed to react? I think the other thing that Johnson is doing here is he's placing us in a hospital, in an emergency room, where we often experience really different kinds of uh, humor. And as anyone knows who spends, spends a lot of time around doctors and nurses, there is obviously a kind of gallows humor that goes with dealing with horrific scenes that are often really emotional for people who don't uh, come into contact with them. But J Dennis Johnson kind of puts them in the same place and renders these in a comical way. So what he's up to, well, you'd have to sort of figure that out by reading the rest of the story. But again, I just wanted to give this as an illustration of the kind of thing that a short story does. On an emotional plane, it kind of complicates and shatters our expectations. 
Now, lest you think that I'm just going to give you bizarro surrealist literature, uh, I'll draw your attention now to Grace Paley, who is a beautiful, wonderful comic short story writer. And uh, she is someone who really writes from life and sees the comedy of life. Um, and this is the opening sentences to a story called An Interest in Life. My husband gave me a broom one Christmas. This wasn't right. No one can tell me it was meant kindly. Now, um, I, I think we all get this right away. It sort of lands. Um, this wasn't right. Uh, we get it because in a way, this is the kind of thing where you can imagine someone saying, oh no, he, he, he must have just not really realized that you didn't want a broom, but she knows there's something off about what he's up to. And that line, this wasn't right, I think is just a, a sort of really quick way that we often express our sense that our intuition is telling us that something is off, something is amiss, and that the neat moral explanation we might get for something is not fully acceptable to us. That, um, you know, the sort of neat pat explanation is just not going to do it for the moral experience that we're having. And so I think that Paley is here kind of doing a couple of things that I think about, that, that, that I think are comparable to the sort of mathematical world in, in, in that uh, she's, she's sort of picking up on something she has an ear for. She's showing someone who has an ear for something that's amiss. And then uh, she's going to set up an argument. This isn't quite right. It's like Dedekind. It's not quite right. We're using all of these diagrams that have continuous magnitudes, but we haven't figured out how to render our numbers so that they actually justify that, that diagram. Here, I mean, this is obviously on a moral plane, but the moral intuition is that this isn't quite appropriate as a gift. It's not quite right. And no one can tell me otherwise. I will not sort of sit and accept the simpler explanation that will be maybe pushed under the rug um, of why this is just fine. It's funny because the paragraph goes on to say, it was a really nice broom. It was good quality. He, bu he buys good quality brooms, but I still know, <laughs> you know, this wasn't right. And it turns out that marriage doesn't go very well. And the story is kind of about the dynamics that, that are at play. So it's a subtle mention. Um, you saw in the Kafka example and in um, the uh, example opening the Dennis Johnson piece, there's something just sort of mundane in the background and then it's punctured. Here too, we just have this very simple remark that opens up a world and it kind of shows that there's something deeply unsteady at the heart of this marriage. Um, all right, so where do we go? Where do we go from here? We are, um, okay. Now, I uh, thought also that uh, when I, I would talk a little bit about, I just wanna make sure, yeah, okay, I, I got the right thing coming up. <laughs> um, I want to talk a little bit about another kind of story that really comes to mind when I think about mathematics. And I think that um, it maybe gets a little bit away from a short story because uh, it's its own unique form, and that's the koan. Um, so I need, I'm going to read some passages from a koan that I think really capture something about mathematics that I talked about earlier, which is that it often requires that we sort of beat our heads up against it, try it out in a lot of different ways. And it does really feel like we're kind of shaping our brains and kind of clonking them into a place where we are capable of seeing the system that we're working with in a new light. And um, I should say just before I keep going that I owe a libations to two people for this koan. The, the first is the, the late Carrie Stickney, my colleague who died um, recently. And he, uh, in his wonderful adventurous imagination offered a faculty seminar in 2017 where we read this together. And it was a very impactful seminar for me and I think for many of the people who were there. 
and uh, I, I couldn't find the text that we read and asked around and no one was able to find it. And then I asked Paul Cooley in the Dean's office if he could dig it out and he heroically found it. And so we have it. And I, I think now that it's surfaced again, I think it would be a great one to revisit. Maybe we could have a, another seminar on it in the next year. Um, but in the meantime, I will just read some passages. Um, koans, I think, are memorable in part because they do this thing which involves um, thinking about, uh, uh, they, they, do, they often use this language of sort of beating somebody up. There's a lot of pummeling and punching and getting smacked and blown, uh, uh, you know, uh, upside the head. It's very bizarre, but it also, I think, uh, capture something about how um, jarring and violent in, in a way, not in a literal way, but if in our minds, sometimes a mathematical object is or a story, imaginative object that is impacting us, it really does feel like a blow. And to get it, we need to sort of go through that pummeling. <laughs> um, but maybe literary, mathematical, uh, maybe koans, maybe these works give us a chance to do that in a way that isn't actually physically violent, but does actually open us up in the way that the metaphor suggests. So here are the first paragraphs. At Mount Huang Pao, Lin Chi once met with painful blows. Then he learned how to punch Tai Yu in the ribs. That garrulous old grandmother called him little bedwetting devil. Huang Pao said, this raving idiot coming again to pull the tiger's whiskers. In the craggy glen, he planted some pines to mark the road for people who come after. With his hoe, he hoed the ground and they were all but burn buried alive. Huang Pao approved the young man and gave him a slap on the mouth. On leaving, the master wanted to burn the armrest, but later he sat on the tongues of the men of the world. If not Ho, Honan, then back to Ho Pei, he said. In, in a monastery overlooking the old ford, he offered salvation to those passing back and forth. He had a firm grasp on the essentials of crossing over, a steep cliff rising 10,000 spans. He took away the person, took away the environment, molding and fashioning first-rate disciples. With his three dark gates and three vital seals, he pounded and shaped the monks. Constantly at home, yet never ceasing to be on the road, the true man with no rank, going in and out the gates of the face. The heads of the two halls simultaneously shouted, guests and host were perfectly obvious. Even when illumination and action are simultaneous, fundamentally there is no former or latter, like a flower-shaped mirror confronting an image, an empty valley transmitting a sound. Wonderful his responses, whatever the direction, yet he leaves not the slightest trace. Now, obviously, there's a lot going on in these paragraphs that I, I will not be able to um, elucidate here, but I, I think that this line about um, the monk who is shaping, pounding and shaping the monks kind of reminds us how certain kinds of stories and certain kinds of mathematics actually do sort of reshape our psyches and our minds. And so I, and I think koans are built so that they pummel us while we're reading them in this way. And if we give ourselves over to them, they sort of, they do open up. They're very difficult and they do open up and it's quite profound. And I think that they are one of the kinds of stories that especially resembles proofs that challenge us to completely reconfigure our conceptual world. Um, okay, I'm going to move into the last part of my talk, and I'm just going to touch on a couple of writers who I think um, understand this because I want to just draw attention to them uh, as people who are worth revisiting for the question, but I, I don't want to um, spend, go too far beyond the time that we have together tonight so that we can get to some questions, but um, David Foster Wallace is someone I think I couldn't do a talk like this without mentioning because he is someone who understood mathematics in this way. I think he did a lot of comparing math and literature and had his brain pretty deeply in both places. 
um, he also, I think, understood how much a person immersed in mathematics and in the computational parts of the world that we live in is shaped by those. And so this is a passage from a story he wrote called Little Expressionless Animals. I'll just read a few lines from the beginning because I think it gives us a hint that the story is very much about um, the kind of cognitive experiences that we live in when we are living in a world that is um, involves a lot of kind of disparate facts. The story is about a woman who wins repeatedly at Jeopardy and the, the, there's a lot of references to Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune, these game shows, but the structures of those shows, I think he's playfully playing with to think about games of logic. And uh, she has an autistic brother who eventually beats her at Jeopardy. And the only category that she can't handle is categories that has to do with animals. So that's the sort of her Achilles heel. But the opening of this, this story um, is kind of proof-like. The sentences are very short, like um, they are building towards something. And it, and it also is sort of a cognitive image. And so I want to just draw attention to that because I think he's hinting that that's what he's up to in this story and it's kind of worth thinking about that way. It's 1976, the sky is low and full of clouds. The gray clouds are bulbous and wrinkled and shiny. The sky looks cerebral. Under the sky is a field in the wind. A pale highway runs beside the field. Lots of cars go by. One of the cars stops by the side of the highway. Two small children are brought out of the car by a young woman with a loose face. A man at the wheel of the car stares straight ahead. The children are silent and have very white skin. The woman carries a grocery bag full of something heavy. Her face hangs loose over the bag. She brings the bag and the white children to a wooden fence post by the field by the highway. The children's hands, which are small, are placed on the wooden post. The woman tells the children to touch the post until the car returns. She gets in the car and the car leaves. There is a cow in the field near the fence. The children touch the post. The wind blows. Lots of cars go by. They stay that way all day. Um, anyway, I think this piece sort of speaks for itself, but you feel that paragraph land and it also prompts you to look beyond it and see what on earth this world that he's now set up for us is going to bring about. Um, the last person I'll talk about is Alice Munro, who also, uh, to my delight, um, really understood that mathematics can shape our lived experience very deeply. And she wrote a wonderful story called Too Much Happiness, uh, which is uh, based on the life of the mathematician Sofia Kovalevsky. Um, and Kovalevsky, uh, this is it's a it's a it's a life story, but it also shows that Kovalevsky, in the world that she's inhabiting, thinks in proportions. So the opening of the pair, the the story gives us this sense, this ear for the fact that the mathematical life um, focuses on certain kinds of things. If your brain is oriented in a certain way, it seems, or at least this is how Monroe is depicting it, um, it gives us a sense that there is. Um, you know, that we, 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 certain kinds of, certain facets of life come into relief. On the first day of January in the year 1981, a small woman and a large man are walking in the old cemetery in Genoa. Both of them are around 40 years old. The woman has a childishly large head with a thicket of dark curls and her expression is eager, faintly pleading. Her face has begun to look worn. The man is immense. He weighs 285 pounds, distributed over a large frame, and being Russian, he is often referred to as a bear, also as a Cossack. So um, this story uh, is about their marriage and about the different pursuits in life that they both um, have, and it really depicts her as kind of this delightful, quiet, slightly freakish woman, and this, this slightly large head, I think, is sort of Alice Monroe's way of representing this sort of mathematical type. Um, the last scene that I'll read, and this is the final note that I'll end on, um, is where Monroe talks about the moment when uh, Kovalevsky's teacher first met her and saw her abilities. And it's really interesting because he's wrestling, he sort of sees her as almost this kind of Frankenstein-like figure. 
um, which I think Mary Shelley also kind of knew that the scientist type would be a kind of weirdo type of character. And I think that Monroe is getting this about the mathematician. Um, and her uh, Kovalevsky's teacher is struck by her abilities, but he's also sort of troubled by the fact that she's a poet. Kovalevsky also submitted literary stories and wrote novels. She submitted even to Dostoevsky's literary journal. Imagine that. And um, she was also this brilliant mathematician. And so he's sort of trying to think through what that means. Um, so he says, she was a shock to him in many ways. And then later, he had to be careful about saying what he really believed, that there must be something like intuition in a first-rate mathematician's mind, some listening flair to uncover what had been there all along, rigorous, meticulous, one must be, but so must the great poet. When he finally brought himself to say all this to Sophia, he also said that there were those who would bridle at the word poet in connection with mathematical science. And others, he said, who would leap at the notion all too readily to defend a muddle and laxity in their own thinking. Um, so there's a lot, again, going on here, as there is in all the passages and sections that I've read today. But I, I think there's what, what Monroe has an ear for here is that the, the ways that we engage our minds reverberate in our lives um, all on moral levels. And there's even a kind of proportionality or a taste or an ear for how much rigor a poem or a, a proof must have or a person engaged in those things must have that maybe echoes something like what Aristotle tells us in the opening of the ethics when he's thinking about how precise we need to be in politics. But um, Monroe also gets, I think, that we can sort of mask the, um, the rigor of these arts and sciences, maybe both, um, with the conventions that surround them and the ways that they are carved up and ranked in our world. And so the psychology and the lived experience of poetry and mathematics that she represents, um, I think, remind us that maybe we are sort of losing some of the kinship in those two things together. So I hope that what I've done is give you a bit of a taste for what we might gain by bringing those two worlds together and um, thinking about them as in maybe a kind of conceptual dance between the in intuitive, um, on the intuitive plane between the emotional intuitions and the, the cognitive ones. And um, I hope even more that you'll go back and read some proofs and short stories together with yourselves and see if any of this bears out in your own experience. So thank you again for the chance to think this through. And um, I look forward to our discussion and the questions that will come in a little while.